Welcome, everybody. My name is Lisa Hustis, and it's been my pleasure to have worked with these individuals since January as they've prepared their presentations for you. They all work from very different disciplines, and they've been working to bring their topics together on one particular topic, transparency. Now, of course, when we talk about transparency, as you'll see, what their topics have in common is that they're all looking at questions and they're asking whether or not information would aid or hinder better decision making. And what's so interesting and fascinating about their presentations is that each one of them are looking at really different kinds of problems. I'd like to thank a very special group of students, and I don't know if any of them are here today, but we had some students that came twice during the semester to listen as we practiced our presentation and to provide their insight and comments. Um, and that participation was incredibly fruitful as we started to uh, work on what we're going to present with you today. Are there any students here who were there in helping with us during this process? Okay, well, if they come in and you meet any of them, they are really to be thanked because it was very helpful for us to do that. Um, I am going to allow each one of them to introduce themselves as they stand up and begin their topics. I'm gonna to ask, ask them to tell you what department they're in. Um, in addition to that, what we hope is at the end of each presentation, not each individual presentation, but at the end of all four presentations, we'll be able to open it up for discussion and comments from all of you and questions that you may have. So with the, as they say, no further ado, I am so proud and pleased to present uh, this panel to you for your consideration. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Rose Emmert. Uh, I'm a senior in the economics department. And today I'm going to discuss the recent financialization of contemporary art. This project came out of a behavioral economics class that I took last year. Um, and behavioral economics is sort of the synthesis of psychology and sort of the more formulaic aspects of economics. Um, I use this discipline sort of as a lens uh, for looking at how the financial services industry has infiltrated and exploited the contemporary art market because of its lack of regulation and therefore lack of transparency. So this is a piece by Damien Hirst. He's a British artist from, started around the late 90s. Um, and I'm curious to know if anyone here can take a guess for how much this was sold for. So we're gonna do a little game of maybe Price is Right kind of thing. <laughs> so raise your hand when the dollar range makes sense to you uh, for this. So is there anybody who thinks it was sold for between $10,000 and $100,000? How about $100,000 and a million? How about one million to 10 million? And is there anyone who thinks it was over $10 million? <laughs> well, <laughs> you'd be correct. Um, this piece sold for $100 million in 2007 to an anonymous investment, investment group. Um, it sort of perfectly illustrates the state of high-valued art in the last few decades. Uh, Hearst was really brilliant when he made this. He combined an antiquity, so an 18th century skull, with precious stones, so eight, over 8,000 diamonds. This is Andy Warhol. He's the father of what's called business art these days. Um, he had great foresight in the 1960s when he said that business art is the step that comes after art. The business now is now called, people call it the secret industry. Um, and that's because there's no transparency of information. We really don't know much about it. Um, yet it accounts for 68 billion of the luxury goods market. For comparison, that's about a quarter of the whole fashion and apparel market all over the globe. So that's a very large number. Um, another striking fact is that three quarters of art purchases are made for financial investment and not for aesthetic reasons. It's used, one, as a diversifier for investments, and two, as a form of discrete investing. So the two main players on the sales side are the auction houses and the galleries. I find it very comparable to the New York Stock Exchange, especially when you watch videos of the uh, auctions that are happening at the auction houses, like Christie's and Sotheby's pictured here. There's a lot of rapid fire bidding, a lot of yelling, and now they've moved into a realm of internet trading, uh, much as stock uh, trading has moved into. 
And the man on the right here is Larry Gagosian, and he was one of the first gallerists to strategically put his galleries in financial centers um, solely for the reason of selling the artwork for financial investment. On the other hand, we have the artists, uh, and I use Damien Hurst and Jeff Koons as examples of these. And I call them production artists, and a lot of other writers are starting to call them production artists. Um, Koons was actually a banker for many years before moving into art. Um, and these two artists sort of, they work out of these things called factory studios, and they, they do willingly call it, these, uh, call it that. So often they have nothing to do with the production of the artwork. They didn't actually touch the artwork that they're making. Uh, they hire art students, usually at intern wages, so below minimum wage. Uh, to work and fabricate their works and their ideas. Um, on the top left here is a picture of Jeff Koons in his studio in Chelsea, so not too far away. I imagine he's hired a few Parsons students in his days. <laughs> um, you may be asking, how the heck did these prices get so high? How did we get to this point? And there are many ways and many methods that this has happened, but I'm going to highlight four that I think are the most important. First off, supply and demand is disrupted. Um, there's an amount of product supplied, an amount of demand for a product, and where those two factors meet determines price and, quanti price and quantity, which is called the equilibrium. It's sort of the settling point of the market. And in the case of art, there's only one of everything, so one quantity, and it is demanded by only a small number of the super rich. None of us are probably in the market for Jeff Koons' artwork, right? So, it sort of throws off the scale, and it, it, it turns it into where the prices skyrocket and beyond the true value of the, the actual materials that it's made out of. Uh, and this is called scarcity. We also observe herd mentality. So just as a herd of cattle moves towards water or food, um, and maybe traders do in the stock market, a lot of art collectors do this in the art market. And this is all because of groupthink, or what's called herd mentality. Um, this is a problem because as confidence goes up and down in an artist, the, fluctuate, the price fluctuates quite a bit. Um, if we look at artists like Picasso, uh, Gauguin, Caravaggio, their prices have tumbled in recent years because of information that's come out about the way they've treated their, the way they did treat their uh, female models, and you know these kinds of stories come out, and the, their value really does go down. We can even look to the recent sexual abuse allegations against Chuck Close, whose recent um, retrospective at the National Gallery was actually canceled at the last minute, and that's the kind of thing that really drives up his price. Um, finally, we have something called chandelier bidding, which is really interesting. Uh, it's quite literally chandelier bidding, so the, the bidder stands at the front of the auction house and pretends that somebody made a bid by pointing to a chandelier in between every bid to drive up the price, which I think is quite amazing and probably should be illegal. <laughs> um, Looking at it, art as a financial instrument is interesting. There's a few different things that they do with it. The first being bundling. So if we look at the two artworks on the bottom here, uh, it is Interchange and Number 17A. One of them is a de Kooning painting, the other one's a Pollock painting. They're the two most expensive 20th century paintings ever sold. They were bought together for $500 million uh, by Ken Griffin, who is the uh, founder of Citadel, which is a major hedge fund firm. The reason he buys them in pairs is because if the value of one goes down, he still has the value of the other one to keep the value up. The next thing that we see is called art-based derivative products. Um, so they're products that are being sold off in secondary and tertiary markets, so much as mortgages were uh, pre-2007. 53% of art buyers borrow against their own collection to buy more art, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and because there's no regulation, there's a ton of insider trading that goes on, and it gives a, a competitive edge to people who are in the know. And insider trading, as we all know, is very illegal uh, in the financial markets. And all of these factors sort of lead me to believe that it's very comparable to the housing market pre-2008. Um, a lot of regulations came in after 2008 that dealt with these issues. The biggest issue here is the fact that there's zero regulation. Um, the whole point of having regulation in the financial realms to protect consumers and create an open market for transparency of information. And over the last 20 years, we've watched uh, ex exponential growth in this particular market. And I can't help but speculate that this is a bubble. Um, at the Tribeca Film Festival last year, I went to see a documentary called Blurred Lines Inside the Art World. 
And during the director's q and I thought I'd just push their buttons and say, so when's the bubble going to burst? And the whole room broke out into laughter. And that's the exact same reaction that you would have gotten in 2006 and 2007 when you talked about the housing market. People just laughed at you. They don't want to believe that their, their wealth is going to disappear in seconds, days. So why do we care? We're not people who buy fancy artworks, right? Why do we care? It's in the luxury market. It's something that the 1% do. If it falls apart, what's going to happen? And I've actually found evidence that the art market is being used as collateral for pension funds. And that's something that we need to consider. Um, the first time this became evident was in 1989, when the British Pension Fund, which worked for the British Railroad Workers, uh, sold $65.6 .6 million worth of art in order to fund a pension gap that they had. And the second time I've seen this uh, more recently is when Detroit floated the idea of mortgaging their city's collection in order to deal with, to exit bankruptcy, which was primarily an issue to do with a major pension gap that they had. I thought I'd leave you with a few final thoughts to take with you after sort of digesting all these numbers and, and sort of startling information. The first being, ask your employer if art is being used as collateral to fund your retirement benefits. Um, this is because art is unregulated and it's extremely volatile. Two, recognize that a lot of 21st century art in large museums is business art. For example, if you go to MoMA or the Contemporary Wing at the Met, you might be looking at business art that's being literally stored there by collectors so they avoid paying capital gains taxes because it's in a nonprofit environment. And also, forget about Art Basel and Venice Biennial and all of those big shows that people, gets a lot of hype and a lot of money gets funneled into those. And go to local art festivals and invest in local artists. Uh, I think that's just a really, really important thing. And it's almost a way of democratizing the market if we actually engage with those artists and not ignore them, and only go to the museums and look at these big, expensive pieces of artwork. So thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Hello, all. <clears throat> My name is Mark. I'm a sociology major at Lang. Uh, and kind of in a different turn of transparency, I'll be focusing on research I conducted last semester as part of a Lang Social Science Fellowship. As part of this fellowship, I completed an internship at the, Lang, at the Participatory Budgeting Project, a nonprofit founded actually by a Lang graduate in 2009. At this nonprofit, they help design and implement participatory budgeting processes throughout the US and Canada. And though beginning in Brazil in 1989, participatory budgeting occurs now in 21 US cities, of which New York City is the largest. And so during this internship, I began collecting data on New York City council members and participatory budgeting more generally, which kind of allowed me to become more immersed in the political landscape and make the observation that the majority of these projects were going towards schools. In the last cycle, as you can see, nearly 60% of total projects went towards schools. What in what I call the four primary districts, which are the four districts that had started PB in 2011, 37% of projects have gone towards education. This observation kind of drove me to explore connections between the public school system and this new community-oriented mode of funding. Before I get too into that, let me speak a bit about what is participatory budgeting. Definitionally, it is a direct and participatory democratic practice that allows community members to direct a portion of the city budget. In New York City, where 31 out of the 51 council districts are participating, each district is required to allocate a minimum of $1 million to the process. This $1 million comes out of the section of the overall city's budget called the capital budget. Within the capital budget, as you can see, there's a subsection called discretionary capital funding, which is funding that is allocated to all 51 council districts and is used uh, according to the discretion of the individual council member themselves, which is a distinction that will be useful in my later analysis. Uh, as this chart, see, you can visualize this subdivision, uh, but it is a, a few years outdated. We actually saw over $40 million in the latest cycle allocated through PB. And so the actual process in New York City, it's an annual year-long cycle that consists of four phases, idea collection, budget delegate meetings, election week, and then funding. The idea collection phase begins in the fall, where neighborhood assemblies are held throughout the city to inform residents of PB and to collect project ideas from them. 
The budget delegate meetings are made up of residents who volunteer to convene once a month, and there they help develop which projects are most address the most critical need, and they meet with various city agencies to discuss like the feasibility of these projects. These budget delegates also are also in charge of deciding which projects end up on the final ballot during election week, uh, which actually for the cycle just finished up on Sunday. Uh, it was this whole past week. And then the projects that get the most votes are funded. And so as outlined in the 2017 rule book, participatory budgeting has several principles, empowerment, transparency, inclusion, equality, and community. And as such, participatory budgeting is an attempt at a more transparent mode of funding that focuses on surpassing barriers and pursuing civic engagement with historically disenfranchised communities. This is evident in the actual voting requirements of participatory budgeting, where anyone over the age of 11 can participate in the process regardless of traditional barriers, such as like immigration status, criminal record, or English language proficiency. All that is needed for the vote is proof of residency within the district. And so with this more in-depth understanding of local politics and participatory budgeting, I began working out ways to measure the relationship between participatory budgeting and school inequality. This led me to two reports that kind of helped frame pressing issues of school inequality as issues of funding. The first one, coming from the Service Employees International Union, is entitled Falling Further Apart, where they find these correlations between the percentage of students of color and students that qualify for free lunch to worsening school facility quality. While the second was born out of a 13 year long, 13 year long lawsuit starting in 1993 called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity versus the State of New York. The lawsuit was premised on the unfulfillment on the part of the state to provide a quote, sound basic education due to statewide funding discrepancies. The court ruling in favor of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity in 2006 declared that New York City schools were owed $1.9 billion in constitutionally obligated funding. Furthermore, in 2016, kind of like a 10-year retrospective study, this was recalculated and determined that underfunding remained at $1.9 billion. And so we can see kind of from these two reports that New York City schools are suffering from systemic effects of underfunding and that this underfunding takes its toll on the physical infrastructure of schools, disproportionately affecting low-income students of color. We can also see from the past 10 years that politics, as usual, is not addressing the issue in any substantive manner, begging the question of what can be done. My research approaches this question through the exploration of the potential of participatory budgeting to address these issues through relying on community members themselves to determine the most critical issues, rather than being dependent on the discretion of their council member. And so my research as a preliminary and exploratory look into this process in school inequality is a mixed methods comparative study between two council districts. District 8, which encompasses East Harlem and parts of the South Bronx, and Council District 37, which encompasses Cypress Hills, Bushwick, and East New York. District 8 is one of the four primary council districts that started participatory budgeting in 2011, why District 37 has never elected to do it. And for a little context, District 8 has over twice as many schools and a total district-wide underfunding of 48 million, but the average underfunding per school is significantly less than District 37, which has a total underfunding of $33 million, but an average underfunding of 979,000. And so specifically, in focusing on the relationship between participatory budgeting and school inequality, I statistically analyze the relations between individual projects of both this participatory budgeting process and, to, and the traditional discretionary funding process and compare that to the individual, the underfunding of the individual school that these projects were going to. While, on the other hand, while in attending these neighborhood assemblies, I focused on how residents used their personal experiences to brainstorm projects and also what obstacles they identified within this process. And so in these sessions, I heard a number of East Harlem residents express a variety of concerns that for the most part emanated from their personal experiences of either having difficulty or seeing someone else have difficulty within their community. For example, at the second session, some students from a nearby high school expressed concern over the, the bathroom stalls, pointing out that they really locked and that you could see over them. They continued saying, quote, we're sick and tired of it. We won't be here to see the change, but we want the next generation to come and enjoy it. While at the first session, one of the attendees whose daughters attended a nearby elementary school, which shared a campus, the same building with another school, was concerned about the isolation of these schools that shared the same facilities. 
She intended to learn about participatory budgeting and bring it back to these schools as an alternative way to surpass this isolation and address issues experienced by both schools. She described this as, quote, there's a line, they never interact, I'm here to break that. And so these anecdotes from these sessions illustrate how the ideas considered in participatory budgeting are rooted in the everyday experiences of the neighborhood, while the statistical analysis proves that there are correlations between participatory budgeting projects and school underfunding, indicating that these projects are more likely to go to schools with higher rates of underfunding. This analysis and the use of personal and collective experiences of the everyday suggest that community members have a firmer grasp on critical education needs within their community and that participatory budgeting itself is better suited for allocating these funds rather than the traditional model of discretionary funding. However, participants also expressed discouragement when they recalled projects of theirs that didn't get funded or even make it to the final ballot. When discussing the obstacles between proposing a project and seeing it funded, the residents often turn to this kind of market pitch individualist discourse where one attendee who told us that to be successful you have to quote, show up, show up, show up. While another attendee who referred to herself as a resident and activist expressed frustration over the previous project she proposed and told us that quote, I only push for myself now. And though we understand participatory budgeting as a more transparent and community oriented mode of funding, the practice on the ground often remains contested. It is not simple enough for such a structure to exist where residents can simply play a part in directing the city budget. They must work hard throughout the process to show how their project is quote, worth it. And so in examining participatory budgeting as an alternative and more transparent mode of funding, I found there to be substantive differences between participatory budgeting and traditional model of discretionary funding in both material and qualitative aspects. We see that these projects are more likely to go to schools with higher rates of underfunding, and that the projects themselves, as they are conceived, are rooted in the everyday experiences of the neighborhood. Yet, obstacles remain in the difficulty of getting a project funded, and in participatory budgeting's ability to tackle widespread structural change simply due to the lack of capital necessary to reverse these effects of $1.9 billion in underfunding. However, in the development of this process in New York City, we can see the, the more people that learn and decide to engage with it, the further it grows, leading to further participation and opening up new pots of money. Each year, it continues to see large-scale growth, so that in the latest cycle, we have seen 31 council districts participate, over 100,000 community members have cast a vote, and over $40 million has been allocated. And this past February, we even saw a new initiative, initiative on the part of the mayor creating participatory budgeting processes within every single New York City public high school, so that high school students from now on will collectively determine where a portion of their budget will go to. And so then looking forward, I hope to have kind of piqued some interest and inspired you to engage within your council district and find out if they do participatory budgeting. The more people that participate means the more opportunity for growth. And so I, I kind of urge you to look at projects that won this past week, what was on the ballot to get a little inspiration. Uh, and if your council district isn't doing participatory budgeting, you can attend community board meetings or town halls or even this email your council office and let them know that you're interested. For a little more tangible efforts in District 3, uh, Council District 3 that is west of Fifth Avenue in Chelsea, West Village, uh, there's about eight projects on the ballot this year, including uh, like lighting with historic uh, lampposts along 7th Avenue to increase visibility. There are technology and facility upgrades district-wide for public schools and several public housing-related projects. This year, residents were able to vote on, uh, online or in person or even in those, those uh, link New York City terminals that are popping up all over the place. And so participatory budgeting is perhaps one of the most simplest ways, whether you're a student, a parent, anything, to begin playing a part within your community and to get involved with local politics. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emma. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. I'm Emma McLaughlin, and I'm studying politics at Lang. Uh, well, sorry. Let me... okay. Last summer, um, while interning at the Laborers, Employers, Cooperation, and Education Trust, I became aware of some of the many problems concerning land use changes and public building in New York City. I was working primarily on research for policy that would have an impact on local construction workers. 
This internship was preceded by a research fellowship I did as a Lang Social Science Fellow at the New York City Central Labor Council. Um, today I'll be sharing with you some of my experiences and the research that came out of both of those internships. But I'd like to begin by asking a couple of questions. How many of you know who your local city council representative is? Okay. How many of you know what community board district you live in or have ever been to a community board meeting? All right. Okay. I'm going to explain why it's important for you to find out. <laughs> Before these internships, I could not have answered those questions. I had never really thought about local government in New York City or construction workers that we see at work every day or an intersection between those two things. One place where they meet most often, sorry, one place where they meet most often is in the New York City land use rezoning process. If you take a piece of land, like an empty lot or an old building or a stretch of subway tracks that the city owns and wants to do something with, they can't just do it without going through a very specific process that requires various groups and individuals' approval and input. As an intern with the laborers, I learned about a campaign to stop a proposed redevelopment on the Bedford Union Armory, which you can see here, in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, which is that red box. Um, so a few years ago, the city decided that they wanted to redevelop the Bedford Union Armory to include some commercial spaces, housing, a gym, among other things. The process for rezoning ULERP, which stands for Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, requires community boards, the Department of City Planning, the Borough President, the City Council Land Use Committee, the City Council as a whole, and all of its 51 members, the council member representing a district, the mayor, and the Department of City Planning again to approve a land use rezoning. That's a lot of people. The redevelopment of the Bedford Union Armory, since it was on public land, became controversial because so many different groups felt they had a right to it. It had been used for a time as a homeless shelter and was currently being used as a homeless shelter while this process was going forward. And questions arose about what would happen to the homeless people who had been living there. Questions came up about how affordable housing would be implemented. The developer wanted to include luxury condominiums in the building, um, but the community didn't want this because they thought it would raise local rent prices, leading to gentrification. The city took the stance that since this project required affordable housing according to area median income, or AMI, designations, it would be a good thing, but the community argued that this did not necessarily guarantee affordability. So what's an AMI, or area median income? It means that in your area, there's an average income for a family depending on size. The AMI is used to calculate what an affordable rent price might be or how affordable, affordable housing can be calculated. This is important because affordable housing is often a requirement when a residential building is built at a certain size or on land owned by the city. The AMI in 2017 was set at $66,800 for an individual in New York City. But the problem with this formula is that the area included in this equation is all of New York City. That means that the median income is determined by the city to be applied the same way when it comes to affordable housing on the Upper East Side, in the Far Rockaways, in Crown Heights, on the South Shore of Staten Island, or even in the West Village. Regardless of whether or not the average individual in any given neighborhood is making significantly less than $66,800 a year, or significantly more. The city of New York, in certain situations, can require that a certain number of rentals units be built and rented at affordable prices according to AMI, which you can see here. So for an individual, let's say you want to live in a studio apartment, it should be below $1,377 if you're making $66,800 a year, ideally. Um, the city of New York can require this. But the community, in the case of the Bedford Union Armory, didn't want any luxury condominiums because they argued that this would lead to gentrification and raise local rents. This has happened in many communities throughout New York City and elsewhere before. When new luxury apartments are built and wealthier people move into a neighborhood, soon more expensive stores follow them. When these stores are like 
Whole Foods or Targets, local stores often do not have the budgets to compete with them or the rent prices that these big stores can afford to pay or lease land for. Um, the same happens to tenants. Wealthier tenants move in and former residents can no longer afford to pay the same rents as them. People that could previously afford to live in a neighborhood are effectively displaced and have to move elsewhere. In the case of the Bedford Union Armory in Crown Heights, the city council person representing that district eventually removed the luxury units from the redevelopment plan. This required more units to be built because lowering rents needed to be supplemented with more rents paid. 250 of the units will be offered at below 60% area median income, which is $57,000. So 60% of the 66,800. Um, but that's still $57,000, despite the fact that the average income for a family in New York City is 40, or sorry, in Crown Heights is $43,000 a year. At the end of the day, when it comes to land use rezoning requests in New York, the responsibility lies mostly with the local city council person who represents a district where a rezoning is proposed. Why is that? In the case of the Bedford Union Armory, Council Member Cumbo admitted that not everyone would be happy with the changes, but they seemed the best way to go with all parties considered. Despite widespread community outrage and a no vote from the borough presidents and community boards, only two out of Cumbo's fellow council members voted against the plan. There is a broader issue here beyond the Bedford Union Armory redevelopment that is reminiscent of the city council's voting protocol as a whole. In my research at the Central Labor Council, I found that every bill voted on in the New York City Council between 2014 and 2017 had passed, with an average of over 95% in the vote, of votes in the affirmative. So nothing had been vetoed, nothing received a no vote, and everything passed with over 95% of votes in the affirmative. While bills are different than votes on land use items, the pattern remains the same. In five of the biggest land use rezonings of the past city council session and this session, including land use votes in Brooklyn, East Harlem, and the Bronx, there was only one occasion where anyone voted no at all, and even then only two members voted in opposition of the land use proposal. Where there is opposition, it's rare, and usually only takes place as a statement to the community in cases of bills. So for example, out of 51 city council members in the last term, only three were Republicans, and they voted more favor favorably in issue on issues that supported police officers. So they would vote in opposition of legislation that aimed to restrict police officers' use of force, but never against a fellow city council member's land use rezoning proposal. With land use proposals, city council members follow a protocol where all members vote the same way the member whose district the land use rezoning is in is taking place in votes. So since Lori Cumbo voted to approve the Bedford Union Armory proposal, the rest of the council members followed suit. During my research, I asked various elected officials, lobbyists, and experts on New York City politics why this was, and the general consensus was that nobody knows a city council member's district as well as their member that represents it, and they needed to be trusted to choose what was right for their neighborhood and community. In a city like New York, I argue that this is not rational. This reflects an attitude towards land use rezoning that is much more reflective of neighborhood planning rather than citywide planning, despite the fact that such rezonings have citywide consequences. This is happening in East Harlem, in Bed-Stuy, in Bushwick, and the Bronx, predominantly affecting low-income people of color. Here, there is transparency. We have all of these fancy graphs and charts from the city and statements and hearing transcripts and vote counts. A community member has opportunities to voice the, their concerns. There is an extremely clear timeline, but there is so much within the process that is not accounted for. People are not necessarily told that if a Whole Foods or an Equinox comes to their neighborhood, their rent prices will go up, but this happens. Here's an article from Time Magazine from the real estate section explaining why it's good for increasing property values when one of these stores moves into your neighborhood. If it's good for increasing property values, that means it's good for landlords because they can raise your rents. Residents do not always necessarily know when their apartment is designated as an affordable unit because despite being below the rent designated as affordable by the AMI, it is not affordable to them. 
It is irrational that an apartment that is designated as affordable when the rent is aimed, sorry, it is irrational that an apartment is designated as affordable when the people living in an area cannot afford to live there. So what is a solution? Beyond government implementations, such as increased civic education or a broader focus on citywide planning rather than neighborhood planning, there are things that we can do. You can find out who your elected officials are. The next election is in November of 2021, so you've got a few years to figure it out. Um, if you're ever annoyed by increasing rent prices or the fact that the AMI for New York City is $66,800, you can go to your community board and make those complaints. And if your local city council member isn't there listening, their staff will be, and they'll get, that'll get back to the council member. Maybe you can't vote in a New York City election. You can ask your school why one of the cheapest dorm options, which gets you a shared room for $16,200 um, for about eight months, which comes to about $2,025 a month, which is, according to the city of New York, about the same price as what a two-bedroom apartment should cost to rent for someone making the median income in the city is. Um, you, when you go to look for an apartment, you can try to set your budget at what is affordable for an average person in a neighborhood rather than what you or your family as outsiders moving in can afford to pay. A year ago, I knew nothing about the political landscape in this city, the construction industry, or how public land gets rezoned. It is easy to say that you just go to school in this city, that you aren't really a resident. But if you walk down the street and expect not to get hit by falling construction materials, or you expect your rent not to jump, jump hundreds of dollars month to month, or your local bodega to be open in a few months, then you owe it to your community to not only care, but to not actively displace residents who have been building the community much longer than you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Andre Nahimi, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about high-quality chocolate production in Colombia. Because I believe that this rising industry is really an invitation for the people all over the world's supply chains to rethink the meaning of transparency when it comes to the products that we buy. I decided to research this topic while I entered at the Acumen Fund in New York City, a nonprofit global venture fund that is determined to change the way that the world tackles poverty. This fund does this by raising charitable donations and investing them in turn in entrepreneurs that are developing market-based approaches that are intended to serve the world's poor. And during the, my time there, I was introduced to the idea that chocolate, which comes from the cacao fruit here pictured, could be more than something I loved. In fact, I realized that the high-quality chocolate industry could really be a tool for bringing thousands of farmers out of poverty. So I started my internship right after Acumen had announced their expansion to Latin America, and one of their investments immediately caught my attention. They had just invested in Carlos Velasco and Mayumi Osaka, the two entrepreneurs that created Cacao Hunters, the company that manufactures this bar. Cacao Hunters started with a mission to find, preserve, promote, and produce varieties of regional Colombian cacao. They believe that by finding unique varieties throughout the country's rural regions and selling it to high-end markets, they could really provide direct market access for cacao, for cacao growing communities and thus significantly better their livelihoods. But above all, and this is what I want to highlight, they were, guiding by what, they were guided by one key commitment, to bring value back to the farmers. And this mission was significant because Carlos and Mayumi had created Cacao Hunters in 2009, a few years before a crucial time in Colombia's history. A few years later, in 2016, after 52 years of guerrilla warfare, the government of Colombia signed a peace agreement with the Revolutionary Armed Forces, otherwise known as the FARC. This was one of the longest running wars in the world, which led to the displacement of about 6 million people. In 2015, Colombia had the world's second largest population of internally displaced persons after Syria. Of these 6 million rural IDPs, 98% lived in poverty and today constitute the most vulnerable population of the country. During the 52 years of conflict, the rural areas were really the breeding ground of the FARC. Farmers were forced to abandon their trades and switch to illicit crop production, from which the FARC really funded its operations. For those who resisted the guerrillas, the consequences were violent and often resulted in forced displacement. 
In the reform projects that resulted from, the, from Colombia's peace agreement, the rural population was central to the government's considerations when it came to ending cocaine production. On the one hand, there were agricultural families which were displaced to urban cities. And these farmers are now being returned to their lands through a legal process of land restitution. And what is important for them is to be reintegrated into a more profitable agricultural process. But on the other hand, there are farmers who stayed in rural areas during the conflict and thus participated in drug production. And for these farmers, what is key is a lucrative crop replacement that will provide them a higher income than if they were producing cocaine. So as I researched, I found that the importance of promoting opportunities for the rural poor was made clear whether they had been victimized or displaced by conflict. But the question that interested me was how? Could high quality chocolate production really be one possible answer? And what I concluded was yes, that indeed chocolate has offered us a fascinating insight. This cacao hunter's bar, which I just showed you, comes from the cacao trees of the Aruaco community, one of the four indigenous populations that today inhabit the Sierra Nevada. The Aruaco people and their territory was dip, deeply impacted by the conflict. And the, government of the, the governor of the Aruacos himself has said recently that here in this land, the country's problems are summarized. In the 1980s, guerrillas entered their territory, deforested thousands of hectares to plant marijuana and cocaine, and in the process, many of the Atahuaco members were killed, and children were forcibly recruited to join the guerrillas. And further, in, in attempts to combat cocaine production, the government's aerial fumigations contributed to the deterioration of the few fertile ecosystems that illicit crop production had left. So today, the Aruaco elders refuse to trade with anyone who they feel might upset the equilibrium of their communities and their culture. Cacao Hunters has been working with the Aruacos for a few years now, as the company sources wet cacao from them, which they process and ferment in their own facilities. Where bars such as these, showing again, <laughs> are manufactured. And in 2016, the transparency reports of cacao hunters actually showed that the Aruacos had experienced a 58% income increase since they had been working with cacao hunters. And currently, cacao hunters works in five regions over Colombia, where over 1,500 smallholder fa families receive efficient training and are insured a stable income of twice the commodity global cacao market price. So what does this look like for us, the consumers in this room? We are starting to see an artisanal chocolate industry take off that has left certifications like fair trade behind and substituted them with a claim of radical transparency. High quality chocolate bars in the United States can today be sold from anywhere for $8 to $15. Take a look at this radical gap in chocolate products. Many of the people I have spoken to during my research had said, you know, I, give why these, I get why these companies are so important and why their work is so significant, but why the price? However, I think a better question is, why do chocolates, such as the classic Hershey's bar, cost 75 cents? What is permitting these companies to charge such low prices for products in which hands are actually involved in production? And the answer is clear because there are six million farming hands that are producing a cacao that supports a $150 billion industry today. 90% of these farmers are poor and make under $2 a day. 70% of the world's cacao is coming from four West African countries where the crop is bought by major chocolate corporations regardless of its quality. Because of this, the once generational practice of cacao is being lost, and according to the International Cacao Organization, by 2020, which is just two years from now, this kind of commodity chocolate production as we know it today will no longer be able to meet global demands. Carlos and Mayumi of Cacao Hunters are part of a new generation of entrepreneurs who are completely ignoring global commodity prices. Their focus is to actually put more money in farmers' pockets. And on top of this, they are using technology and relying on transparency to show the farmers they work with the whole supply chain, from what they are paid to what a consumer would pay for in buying the bar. But there is also something else I want to share with you. A few weeks ago, as I was preparing to conclude my research, I firmly believed that the, ob that the objective of this presentation was simple. 
to show you how the model of these pioneering transparent companies was a clear-cut solution to many of the farming communities that are today suffering in Colombia's post-conflict development. But I was wrong, and in fact, I basically encountered a researcher's worst nightmare, and this is me being transparent about my process. Um, and I want to point towards this shift in my research that occurred a few weeks ago since new studies were released, but also because of social and political developments that came up in, Columbia's, in Colombia, which really called into question the success and feasibility of this work. So yes, this happened and the peace agreement was signed, but there is also another reality. Colombia is currently in a process of transition towards peace, and this process has been slow and challenging. Cocaine production has by no means been eradicated. There are over 100,000 families for which cocaine continues to be the main source of income today. Only three of Colombia's 32 departments are free of cocaine production. Violence still exists. Smaller guerrillas continue to control rural territories and support illicit economies. And in municipalities where cocaine continues to be planted, homicide rates have increased by 11%. But in municipalities where the government has, become, has begun programs of, of substitution for the crops, this, they have met with a resistance that has increased the homicide rate to 33%. In this slide, we have a farmer that was interviewed by Colombian, newspa Colombian newspaper El Tiempo, who he told, if one takes three kilo of cocaine in a backpack and walks five hours to hand it over, you come back with seven to eight million pesos, which comes down to an average of anywhere from $2,500 to $2,900. This price and the demand is not the same when it comes to other crops. So farmers want peace, but the lack of opportunities that, uh, that support these farmers make it difficult to stay away from cocaine production when it comes to surviving extreme poverty. And so to conclude, my message is, to you is still what it was in the beginning. Buy good chocolate, but don't just buy it. Ask yourselves, what does the transparency of this bar and the mission behind it really represent? What we embrace as consumers of craft cacao is real transparency. There are hands involved in this product. Real farmers are growing this and making more money because of it. There are entrepreneurs behind them who are respecting their knowledge, who provide them with access to markets and technological information, who ensure that the farmers they work with are really understanding their supply chains inside and out. These entrepreneurs are also educating us, their consumers. They are asking us to think about the people they work with, the origins of the cacao, the varieties, and the impact that we cause by actually paying for a product. They are also encouraging us to read and download transparency and sourcing reports. And there are also investors who are willing to stand stand by these entrepreneurs, impact funds such as Acumen, who recognize how challenging it is to build long-lasting, sustainable solutions in some of the toughest environments of the world. And hopefully, there will continue to be a growing number of chocolate consumers who are willing to pay for the actual costs of production. But the transparency of this bar also tells us that there are other farmers that are not producing chocolate bars, that are instead continue to produce cocaine. What a consumer of this bar is therefore contributing to is a transitional period in Colombia's history. I want to encourage this way of thinking about the products that we buy, to become educated as consumers, not only about the supply chains that we participate in, but about the social and political context in which these supply chains are operating in. I want to encourage us in this room to look not for a stamp of ethical approval, but for a story behind the products that we choose to consume. Thank you. I hope you all were engaged as I was. So we have some time for some questions. Is there a mic for questions? Questions of any of our participants. Thank you. I have a question for Andreina. Um, could you tell us why certifications like fair trade are being left behind in favor of certifications like uh, radical transparency? 
this? Yeah, OK. So um, for certifications, like, like um, fair trade are definitely important. But the way that they work is by attaching um, a, a small premium on top of the commodity market price. And this premium does not uh, go towards the farmers in their payments. What it goes towards is cooperative funding, such as um, community uh, development, schools, um, training, etc. But farmers are not actually getting more money because of certifications like fair trade. On top of it, fair trade is a certification that is expensive for farmers to um, buy, and it is also expensive for the people that work with them. So, I mean, certifications like fair trade are definitely important, but what is significant is that entrepreneurs in this artisanal cacao industry are actually choosing not to subscribe to certifications like fair trade. Um, and they're asking us to look instead at the stories that they're giving us in their products and to become familiar with their missions and their statements. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? You might have said this at the beginning, and I might have missed it, but I was interested in the participatory funding. Is that a specific to New York? How many other states have such a process? Um, is there precedent elsewhere? Uh, it started in Brazil in 1989, actually. Uh, and it still like, remains largest, globally speaking, in, uh, in Brazil, the region of Brazil. Uh, but in the US, there's 21 other cities doing it. Uh, but New York City has the largest ongoing process. Uh, okay, my question's for Emma. Um, I just wonder if you could expand on the lack of vetoes. Like, I don't think I fully understood why there is such a lack of, yeah. So in the last city council session, there was a pattern between the speaker of the city council wh who got to determine what was voted on each time. So she just didn't bring up votes that she didn't want to pass or didn't think would pass. And there's something called a, there's a way for them to force it to a vote but it was never used in the past session um, because the only times it was considered to be used was in outlawing the use of a headlock by police officers and creating penalties for that. But the mayor said that he would veto that um, and they made a deal with the police commissioner and it didn't pass. But that was the most controversial thing and there was just sort of an agreement between the speaker of the city council and the other members and the mayor. But now there's a new speaker and hopefully that pattern will change because a lot of people had a big problem with that. Anna, if I could ask you a question. You didn't have time in your, um, in your presentation to explain um, some of the ways, particularly the lack of transparency, but some of the ways that the market can be manipulated from the get-go in terms of art, and how um, you know you did you did show us on your chart how uh, how difficult it is to price a piece of art. But are, what are some of the ways that the artist or the artist's agent can sort of manipulate the market from the beginning to sort of uh, play or manipulate the pricing as yeah. it goes along? Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of artists, say you graduate from Parsons and Fine Art or something, you'll, you'll go to galleries and try to, on your own, try to get into a gallery and get your artwork shown, and oftentimes that doesn't work. Um, a lot of artists, especially in this sort of business art realm, go towards managers and uh, publicity people. And it's very similar to what we see in entertainment industry where they sort of build up the personality. It's about the person. It's not actually about the artwork. It's about what they do, what they believe in, what kind of a person they are. Um, maybe some something that they represent that they think might sell and then they go to the galleries and they put on these big shows that um, drive up a lot of interest maybe the New York Times writes about it maybe art table writes about it you know all the different uh, journals write about it and it's it's almost kind of a, a big marketing scheme it's really interesting because we always ask the question you know you know you go into MoMA and you go wait that what I could do that you know or whatever are those kinds of questions and it's, it's mostly because um, of these sort of marketing and PR 
sort of machines that are behind the people. Um, and the example that I brought up of Chuck Close, uh, he's about to do a re he was about to do a retrospective at the National Gallery, and um, we used to never see retrospectives of alive artists, right? It was just after they died. Um, and now that he's sort of fallen out of favor because of the things that have, stories have come up about him, whether they're true or not, um, these are the kind of artists where their PR people decide, let's do a retrospective. Let's put them back into the public eye. Let's make them big. Let's make them important again. Let's make them relevant. And um, the fact that that got canceled is a really big, big thing on his sort of value as a stock almost. I think of the individuals as stocks almost, businesses, you know, the confidence in them, the story around them, the sort of allegory of the artist. That makes me wonder about alternative models in mm -hmm. the art world, and I know that certainly that there are there are cooperative galleries, and they yes, know that there's yeah. also been a movement for artists to retain an interest in their artworks. Exactly, I, I, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about any sort of pushback or ways that that there are uh, yeah. alternatives to this? Yeah, a lot of uh, new artists who don't want to take part in this sort of big corporate machine that that the art world has kind of become. Um, they end up having to do all the work themselves. So they're they're the agent. They're the person who goes to the gallery who, meaning the agent goes to the gallery, make sure that things get put on the wall. They're the PR person. They do the website, all these kinds of things. Uh, and it's very difficult uh, for them to manage that. There is this sort of co-op um, gallery space kind of thing that's been happening, but it's really hard to do in big cities like New York, because we all know that real estate prices are huge. You know, So the, these galleries that are in Chelsea are paying millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, to buy the space or to rent the space over the course of a few years. Um, so they have to have really big returns. And the co-ops are not having as big returns, you know, so they're, they're small scale. So it's difficult to do that. Um, I'm starting to wonder if the art world is not going to be in the big cities like it has been in the last, you know, 50 years or so, since, you know, Andy Warhol's time where it was New York, New York, New York. I'm starting to wonder if the artists are actually more scattered and with the internet there's a lot of ways to find out about new artists and you can buy artwork online and you can go see them in other places. So I think that, I think the internet is actually a good development in that, in that sense. Uh, my question is also for Emma. I wanted to know, in all the research that you did, do you feel as if the gentrification, gentrification efforts in Bed-Stuy and like Crown Heights, do you feel that it's going to get worse, or is there like a gradual, like escape from that happening? Honestly, I like a couple weeks ago there was a, another vote in. The Bronx for Jerome Avenue. I think that it's more likely to spread to other boroughs. Mostly, I think it's going to happen more and more in the Bronx um, and in other parts of Brooklyn. Like now that it's happened in one place in Crown Heights, it'll probably happen another. But these big developments that the city p puts forward just allow for more to come. And so it's the beginning. Like right now, people might not be displaced in Crown Heights, but five years from now, the neighborhood's going to probably look very different. And I think that unless there's a reform to the process and how it takes place and who is allowed to be a part of it, I think it's very unlikely that things will get better, sadly. To follow up on that comment, have, when you were speaking to various legislators and talking to them, did you bring up at all the results of your research where you had found uh, that there had been no opposition to any of these votes in, in an effort to try to convince them that perhaps that this was a bigger issue than they were perceiving it? I asked one city council member why there was so little opposition, and she paused and then said, um, I think it's mostly budgetary. There's like an $80 million budget, or billion, I don't even, it's huge. And everyone else I talked to basically said that if they wanted to do something, they could figure out how. Um, and of course, city council members were all aware of what was happening, but they said that things were changing in other ways and certain bills were being prioritized over others. And other people that I talked to outside of elected officials mostly just said that the change wasn't going to happen 
when there's an entire city council controlled entirely by one party because there's no room for opposition because everyone is supposed to think the same way rather than there being space for different ideas. And a lot of people and lobbyists that I talked to said that change would have to come from other parties like the Working Families Party in New York City. But. Okay, well, we are out of time at this point, but I want to thank everybody here, and I particularly want to thank our panel for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you.